Okay, good morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. We've got a few folks that we still expect to arrive, but uh, we'll stay reasonably on time. So welcome to the 2016 Sierra Nevada Watershed Improvement Program uh, Summit. Um, we are thrilled with the, the turnout, thrilled to have many of our governmental partners in this effort up here with us. Um, we've got a full morning of um, information we're going to be throwing at you. Um, and we really look forward to, to having some conversation with the folks that are here. Um, I'm going to start by introducing the folks that are up here on the dais, and um, Russ is over there in the corner by himself, so we'll start there. Um, we have Russ Henley representing the California Natural Resources Agency. Um, we'll go over to the other corner, S.D. Stifel from the Bureau of Land Management. Rudy Schmeck is with the National Park Service. Pam Giacomini is on the Sierra Nevada Conservancy Board, um, one of the two board members working on the WIP as the, our board committee. Um, but given that RCRC isn't here, she's also representing co county supervisors from throughout the region. So feel free to be empowered. Um, <laughs> Alex, Alex Friend is with the Pacific Southwest Research Station. Chief Ken Pimlot is the director of CAL FIRE. And my cohort here is Barney Gant, deputy regional forester with the US Forest Service Region 5. Um, so this, this effort that we're undertaking is a um, a partnership that we'll we'll talk a little bit more um, about later in the later in the morning, but a partnership that is led by the Forest Service and the Sierra Nevada Conservancy, under the guidance of a memorandum of understanding signed by Secretary Natural Resources Secretary John Laird and Randy Moore, the regional forester, in which uh, we were deemed uh, designated as the um, lead state agency in working with the Forest Service. So the Watershed Improvement Program is a a major undertaking. Um, today's focus is the forest carbon story. We felt that given the many things that are going on in the state of California to try to address the issue of a, of a changing climate and issues of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, that this was a timely and critically important topic. So we chose that for our um, focus for today. Um, we're going to start off the morning with a, a few opening comments um, from the Natural Resources Agency. We spent most of the uh, most of the afternoon with Secretary Laird yesterday at our uh, Sierra Nevada Conservancy Board meeting, and really appreciated his uh, involvement in that and um, his efforts and comments. Um, but we're thrilled this morning to have with us the Undersecretary of the California Natural Resources Agency, Janelle Bielan, who is uh, a major player on virtually every policy that we are working on under the uh, under the whip, and we are really pleased to have you here this morning, Janelle. So if you say some words, we'd appreciate it. There we go. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be here and uh, participate on behalf of Secretary Laird. He was uh, hoping to do this, kick this summit off this morning, but had to testify in our budget committee, our budget subcommittee hearing on um, some of the Natural Resources Agency proposals. So he regrets not being able to be here, but I appreciate the uh, opportunity to serve as his backup. And as Jim mentioned, um, we've been working really closely with the Sierra Nevada Conservancy um, and many of you here in the room to um, help further the goals and efforts of the Watershed Improvement Program. Secretary Laird did sign the MOU um, along with the U.S. Forest Service in the hope that this would chart us uh, a good course forward on how we can address some of the issues we're facing. Um, the Natural Resources Agency is currently very deeply involved in two of the governor's five climate pillars. Protecting and managing natural and working lands, forests, rangelands, wetlands, farmlands, and natural e ecosystems to service uh, carbon sinks is one of the, the biggest pillars that we're um, challenged with and almost all of this of course falls under the Natural Resources Agency umbrella and our about three dozen boards, commissions, departments, conservancies, councils that are charged with natural resources agency management. Um, we also have our, our climate adaptation uh, plan which is safeguarding California and this is the responsibility of the agency to prepare and monitor accomplishments and update over time. And I did want to let you all know that it looks like we are going to be ready to roll out the implementation plan for safeguarding um, by next Friday. So be looking for an announcement on that. And hopefully the staff isn't upstairs going, why'd she say that right now? <laughs> um, <laughs> but 
you can meet deadlines. Um, <clears throat> so that I think for us at the Natural Resources Agency, we really recognize this, that the scale of natural and working lands and the scale of climate change mean, mean that we need to work really hard at the, at the landscape level. Um, the Natural Resources Agency has been taking a number of steps to ensure that we can collaboratively <clears throat> collaborate effectively at the landscape level. Um, and some examples are the, the signing of the MOU with the um, Watershed Improvement Program. We also have a, a California Headwaters Partnership with the federal government and federal agencies that we're very um, excited about working together with them on um, to, to um, further many of the goals and objectives of our protected um, rangelands and forest lands and um, upper watersheds. Um, and then uh, we also have, and I, I don't know if Ken's planning on talking about this, but the Good Neighbor Authority Master Agreement with the Forest Service, which um, allows entities under the resources agencies such as the Sierra Nevada Conservancy, CAL FIRE, the Conservation Corps, and the Department of Conservation to work directly on national, national forest lands to conduct restoration activities. So another important component of the efforts that are underway. Um, you know, the forests of the Sierra Nevada region are critically important, storing almost half of the state's total forest carbon. So if you stop and think about that for a minute, almost half um, in the Sierra Nevada of the, the forest carbon storage that we look to um, to help meet the governor's GHG reduction goals, are, the potential is there in the Sierra Nevada. Um, and then when, when healthy, these Sierra forests can absorb enough additional carbon to offset the annual CO2 emissions of almost 2.7 million cars. So that is the good news about the potential that we see in the Sierra Nevada forests. Um, but as you know, and I think part of the point of this uh, summit and this program today is we are facing some challenges and this, the health of the Sierra Nevada forests are severely declining. Um, 29 million trees are dead statewide and about 80 percent of those trees are in the Sierra. We'll likely set the record for the most acres burned in a decade on the west slope of the Sierra this year and we still have three fire seasons to go before the end of, the, of this decade. Wildfire severity in the Sierra is increasing and in areas burned at high severity, most trees die, start decaying, release CO2 back into the atmosphere, and no longer absorb and store carbon. Today, Sierra forests store less carbon than they did 150 years ago, even though there are more trees. Um, larger trees store more carbon than small trees and shrubs, absorb carbon faster, and are more resilient in the face of fire, drought, and insect attacks. So what you're going to be talking about today and the many strategies that we're looking and hoping that um, we can work together to employ are significant for a lot of, of these reasons. And I guess I wanted to just conclude by saying that, um, you know, a lot of the programs that the Natural Resources Agency supports that will help restore our forests include um, the Tree Mortality Task Force, which was created by the governor's executive order. Um, this, this program itself is really significant in the efforts to bring back the forests in um, the Sierra Nevada and, and restore California's potential to um, reduce carbon emissions and meet the governor's goals, CO2 reduction goals. Um, our California Water Action Plan, which has been the cornerstone for all of us and sort of our rallying cry on restoration as well as um, making our water systems resilient and restoring our ecosystems um, in the face of, of changing climate and the many challenges that we're seeing. Um, and then the, our, the Forest Carbon Action Team or, and the Forest Carbon Plan, Prop 1, and Safeguarding are a couple of the other uh, major programs that we're undertaking. So we've got a lot of work in this area and I think you're going to hear a lot of bad news today probably from a lot of people. but want you to also sort of keep that in perspective that we are actually putting a lot of manpower and a lot of effort and a lot of focus on what we can do to sort of tip the balance and, and change things back for the future. 
Um, and I think with that, I'll conclude. And, and again, thank you for having me here and giving me the opportunity to open this up for you. And good luck. And I hope the conference or summit goes well today. <clears throat> Thank you, Janelle. Appreciate your being here. Um, and I think the, the amount of activity going on that uh, Janelle mentioned is part of what we'll be hearing a little bit more about in a little more depth today. So um, certainly are a lot of things going on. And it will be a day of, oh, no. I can't believe that's what we're hearing. And But there is hope. So thanks for kind of setting the stage for that today. Um, it's going to be a little bit of musical chairs here for a couple of minutes, so I just want to, um, we'll, be, we'll be doing some things. We've been joined by Edie Chang of the California Air Resources Board, and Stacy Heaton, who is sitting in for the rural representatives, no, rural county, rural county representatives of California. Still RCRC, but let me stumble over that. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to my, uh, my colleague from the U.S. Forest Service, Randy Moore, is, is ill this week, and so he is being ably represented by Barney Gant, who um, we see a lot. And so Barney, maybe some opening comments. So good morning. Um, Randy regrets not being able to be here today, but I'm excited about being here. So Janelle, I'm going to go with a different spin. I think it's a little bit more positive. So I've got a list here. But before I do, I do want to share just a quick story with you, and I promise you I'll tie this into what I'm going to talk about. So when I started with the Forest Service, I started as a fisheries biologist. And so when I started, a technician had been on the district for a long time. He asked me a very important question. He asked me the question, which way does water flow? So I thought that was a trick question. So I said, OK, I've had about seven or eight years of college. I said, it flows downhill. And he said, you know what, boy, I believe you're going to be OK. Um, <laughs> so that was in North Carolina, and that was like a really huge compliment, if you, if you know what I'm talking about. So, so here's why that's important. I'll wait till you guys quit laughing. <laughs> Focus on the California headwaters. So when you think about that, everything flows downhill. And so one of the things I learned early on as a fisheries biologist, I could get a sense of what we were doing on the upper landscape with the fish. So here's the importance of what we're talking about. To the average person, we want plenty of water, and we want it clean when we want it. It's a general thing that I've learned over time. Um, but we do need some help. So our headwaters principles and our, our California headwaters and the watershed improvement program, it didn't just begin. So what I have, I just kind of have some dates that I want to just describe the work that we've done. And this is the picture's positive, Janelle. So in 2011, the Forest Service, uh, we came in, in, with our ecological restoration. And what we identified is that in order to get our landscape back in a resilient state, we needed to treat about 500,000 acres a year. There's about a six to nine million acre backlog of the work that we need to do. So in 2011, we created our ecological restoration, which a part of that probably involved and has a lot of other fingerprints on many of the people that are in this room. All right, so that was a beginning place for us. All right, in 2012, you know, so the state of California, we released the, the uh, Bioenergy Action Plan. Also in 2012, Senate Bill, Senate Bill 1122, uh, with looking at a 50-megawatt carve-out. So we still have some work to do. But think about the amount of effort and energy that went into the acknowledgement that we needed to have biomass or carve-out as a part of that. All right, and in 2013, the uh, Association of California Water Associations, the Board of Directors, came out with their headwaters policy. So you think about the shift that has occurred. So now you're looking at the importance and the recognition that we need, we as a state, need to look at how we make a difference in our headwaters. Okay, 2014, so the governor signed his action plan. All right, and in that same time, we, the agency, said, of the Sierra Nevada framework lawsuit that was a decade in the making. And then also in November, you had the Proposition 1, which is the, the uh, water bond, $7.5 billion. In 2015, you know, the uh, Aqua had their headwaters framework that launched. In that same year, March, Sierra Nevada Conservancy, along with the Forest Service, we came out with our uh, watershed improvement program. In August, 
We signed an MOU in, uh, in October. We signed an MOU uh, for prescribed fire signed between the Forest Service, CAL FIRE, SNC, and a lot of other organizations, knowing that we needed to use fire as a piece to get back on our landscape if we were going to get it back resilient. That's a subset. In 2016, I know that Ken may talk about this, but we had the Good Neighbor Authority. We signed an agreement with Randy and Secretary Laird. We also had a prescribed fire MOU in media event. And then, um, and then March is the anniversary. So as we talk about the California headwaters, it didn't just start last week. It's been an acknowledgement that has been in the making for several years that we acknowledge that we need to do something different. So in my job as a deputy for, for resources, I get an opportunity to, to do and be involved with a lot of different things. So I oversee budget, tribal relations, all the need portfolio litigation, our vegetation program, and, in, and inventory and monitoring and our data. So every day I get an opportunity to see what it takes for us to be able to make a difference on the landscape. So I think even though we may hear some news, so now we still have some challenges. But if I think about this short list that we put together of our efforts, because many of the, in this, uh, been in this room have been a part of these efforts that, we, that I just talked about. That takes a lot of energy to make that happen, a lot of moving pieces and parts. So for me, I think about how do we link in and talk about our world as a system? Because for the Forest Service, even though you know, we're looking at managing about 20 million acres, we don't exist on the landscape by ourselves. And what we do or don't do affects the rural communities and also the downstream users. You know, for me, so thinking about today as a one-year anniversary of the Watershed Improvement Program, it didn't just start. It didn't just start a year ago. It started several years ago, knowing that in order for us, we're going to have to do something different. And I think this summit represents that. We know that, you know, in, in, as far as the livelihood of our communities, the importance of water, that we're going to have to do something different. We've got challenges, we do. We've got infrastructure challenges. We've got insect and disease. Sure we do. But we've already demonstrated that we're willing to work together to solve these problems. And so I'm excited, you know, for the rest of the day to, to talk about those things and hear the different presentations about the summit. But for the Forest Service, I'll just let you know, we're all in. We know that we're a big part of California, and we're going to continue to work as hard as we possibly can to make a difference and get our, our forest back in a resilient state and help with the protection of our headwaters. Thanks. So I have no one to blame but myself to follow Barney, um, which is easy. Not only did he say most things in his say to all the time, I had allotted for my comments. So thanks, Barney. Um, and I sometimes refer to him as Reverend Gant, and you might understand why. So um, I could better do. I, Thanks for saving me a minute. Um, I do want to acknowledge uh, a couple of uh, a couple of other or some other folks in, in the room. Up in the front row or in some of the front rows are members of the Sierra Nevada Conservancy Governing Board. Maybe just give a wave, and um, we appreciate them being here. We met yesterday in Sacramento. We have a quarterly meeting in Sacramento, and um, the issues we're talking about today, the watershed improvement program in general, are things that our board um, has been providing us great. Um, leadership and support and prodding and um, it's it's a it's a major undertaking for our organization working with our partners. Um, in addition to all the things Barney talked about, I wanted to mention just a couple of things that um, have been happening um, since we since we launched the Watershed Pro Pro Program. First of all, we have a um, a regional strategy that's been developed. It's in draft form. We would welcome public uh, review and comment. That uh, document is available at our newly launched. Um, website for the Watershed Improvement Program, which is RestoreTheSierraDark.org. Um, so that information and lots of other information about the WIP is there, and we are um, going to continue to take public comment until March 18. So you have some time to uh, to let us know your thoughts about that. The other thing I would mention is we are currently, beyond all the other things that are going on, we're really in the uh, in a the assessment phase of really trying to better identify and quantify the restoration needs that exist across the Sierra Nevada, um, holistic, uh, and holistic approach. So it's forest, it's meadows, it's streams, it's it's uh, abandoned mine lands. It's a number of things that are really uh, important to to address in this issue. So. Um, the Forest Service has uh, kind of led the way as a federal agency in, in doing the, the assessment. That process is underway, and we hope to, to have results early in the, in the summer that will 
paint a better picture of what the what the true needs are, what the costs are roughly associated with those needs, and what the what the constraints are, and the policy issues that we should be looking at to address. Um, We've been in conversations with Bureau of Land Management and the Park Service to do um, a similar assessments of sorts. And then we are working across the, uh, the Sierra to develop watershed level assessments, which really are assessments of, of what we know about the watershed and the things that are going on there. So plans, initiatives, um, who are the parties that are, that are most, uh, most involved in these issues, are there projects that have been identified and so on. So those assessments all come together this summer and I think will give us a much better story to tell. In the meantime, you'll hear today from um, some of our partners and the work that we're all involved in, there's, there's a lot going on. We're not waiting for the assessments to be completed. Um, one of the outcomes of last year's event was um, Director Chuck Bonham of the Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, approaching the Forest Service and saying, I've, I've got a charge in the California Water Action Plan to restore 10,000 acres of Sierra Meadows. Uh, if I work with you guys, maybe we can double that number. So there's been a coordinated effort going on um, um, since that time in terms of really trying to be strategic about meadow restoration. Um, I think Chief Pimlot may talk a little bit about a, a pilot we've all been working together to, to try to understand that why, as we address the tree mortality issue, there are broader um, watershed issues that we need to, to be as efficient and as strategic about. And so there's, there's, there's a lot happening even as we do this assessment. I just wanted to, uh, to mention that. So um, I think at this point we're ready to have our, our keynote presenter, um, as it were, and um, we're really thrilled to have uh, Matthew Vertau here with us today. Matt uh, has been here for the last day and a half, and we've been uh, putting him to good use here in Sacramento. We've had a number of meetings and discussions. Um, this is the last time you'll have to hear this, Matt, but I always say to him, you know, We've got um, our science person, Nick Instis, who is good at handing research papers to me that are yellow highlighted so that I can halfway understand what's being said there. And a lot of them have had Matt Hertau as the citation, and it's good to know he really exists. He's not just a, a figure somewhere behind there signing up to these things, and it's been great to be able to, to talk about some of the issues that he's working on in depth. In depth. Um, so Matthew is assistant professor of quantitative ecology, or as he says, forest ecology, um, at the University of New Mexico. He has a BS in forestry at, from Northern Arizona University and got his PhD right down the road from the University of California at Davis. And his research focuses on climate change mitigation and, at, and adapt, adaptation in forest systems. Obviously, it probably still the obvious to say that he has done a lot of work looking at these issues in the Sierra Nevada region, which is why we thought it would be great to bring him up here from New Mexico and um, spend some time with us. So, Matthew, thanks for being here. Yes. All right. Is that better? Okay. So, if we uh, the the what's that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. So if we uh, you know depending on the rate at which we decarbonize the global economy uh, will influence the outcome in terms of uh, the temperature increase we see across the planet. Uh, in the lead up to COP21, there are a number of national level commitments to uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions and if we account for those uh, nation level commitments and they're implemented, we're still looking at about a three degree Celsius increase in mean global temperature. All right. So, uh, in the western U.S., uh, when we look at precipitation, we see a future that looks quite a bit drier. Uh, under projected climate uh, and a range of different scenarios of projected climate. Uh, but regardless of what happens in terms of uh, precipitation falling from the sky, we expect ecosystems in the western U.S. to become drier. 
And the reason is, is that as temperature goes up, the atmosphere is demanding more water, right? So warm air holds more water than cool air. And so it's basically acting as a giant sponge, sucking water out of the ecosystem. So I'll get back to this in a little bit as I talk about drought. But really, uh, regardless of changes in precipitation, if we see a substantial increase in air temperature, the systems get drier. And if we look at the six most common disturbances in North America for forest ecosystems, four of them are climate related. So drought, wildfire, insects, and hurricane. And so we can expect that uh, as changes in climate occur, that the, the frequency, the intensity, the size of these disturbances is likely to increase. And in fact, some work done by the National Research Council that looked at the relationship between increasing temperature and area burned by wildfire across the western U.S. suggests that for each one degree Celsius increase in temperature, uh, we can expect a 73 to 656 percent increase in burned area. So pretty substantial increase there. Uh, Leroy Westerling and colleagues uh, looking specifically at California and taking a, a more sophisticated approach than just the relationship between temperature and area burned uh, have done projections under a range of climate scenarios uh, ranging from relatively uh, wet and warm, uh, cooler on the left hand side A to uh, very warm and dry on the right hand side. And when we look at the outcome in terms of area burned by large wildfires under the, the most pleasant uh, end of century scenario A, uh, we expect to see a two to three fold increase in the area burned by wildfire. And under the uh, potentially much hotter and drier future of the uh, GFDL model here, number, or letter C, we expect uh, as much as a four to five fold increase in the area burned by wildfire and this is in the most carbon dense areas of California, so in the Sierra Nevada and uh, Northern California in the forest. So we took those values, uh, those projections in, in terms of area burned by wildfire and estimated what the emissions would look like from those uh, going forward. And so this figure shows uh, emissions of uh, carbon dioxide in gigagrams uh, over the historic period, so 1970 to 1999 or so, uh, mid-century and late century. And basically, when we compare emissions at the end of this century relative to that historic period, we see as much as a 19 to 101 percent increase in both greenhouse gas emissions and also criteria air pollutants like particulate matter. And so that's over a range of many simulations that we get that range of emissions increases. The median value from all those simulations was about a 56 percent increase. So uh, in addition to the climate aspects uh, that impact wildfire, we've also got a fuel problem to deal with. And as is evident from the discussion so far today, this is in the forefront of a lot of folks' mind. Um, and we're dealing with uh, a, a you know, better part of a century of fire exclusion in a many, many dry forest types. Um, where I live in New Mexico, we've got uh, overly dense ponderosa pine that's got a real high risk of stand replacing fire. A lot out of the work in the Sierra, um, same conditions. And since we don't have direct control over climate at the local level uh, in terms of what we're doing in the forest, uh, we've got to evaluate what are the um, potential benefits of fuels treatments in the system in, in terms of moderating uh, fire severity. And given all the attention on increasing greenhouse gas emissions, we've also got to consider the effects of fuel treatments and restoring surface fire on uh, carbon dynamics. So before I, I get to kind of the work that we've been doing on this topic in a little bit more detail, I wanted to cover a couple of facts that we've got to consider anytime we look at forest carbon. So the first uh, is summed up very nicely in a title uh, of a paper that Nate Stevenson at USGS at Sequoia, down in Sequoia Kings published a couple of years ago, he and his colleagues. And that's that the rate of carbon accumulation increases continuously with tree size. So a big tree sequesters a lot more carbon on an annual basis than a small tree. And they looked at a global database of species and found this trend across that database. And then the other thing that we have to think about is uh, at the forest patch scale. So if 
any given tree is as it grows is pulling more carbon out of the atmosphere how does that change things at the stand scale or the patch scale and what we see here is an increase in carbon to a certain point and that point is uh, determined by prevailing climate conditions and also natural disturbance conditions and we refer to that as the carbon carrying capacity so to represent that I've got this um, hypothetical uh, stand here that experiences a wildfire at time zero uh, right here and then if we assume consistent climate and no disturbance for the next 100 to 120 years we see a recovery in terms of live tree carbon following that stand replacing fire event we also see total carbon come back and so the net result is is that after about 120 years we're at the same level of carbon in the forest that we were prior to uh, that fire so in the drier forest types in the western US uh, where we've been putting out surface fires which historically maintain structure and also the amount of biomass on the surface, um, we've seen a change in the amount of carbon stored in the forest or at least the structure of that carbon. And so um, we've been working on this idea of carbon stability um, from a management perspective for a while. And so the basic hypothesis is, is that if you take a dry fire maintained forest structure and you exclude the natural disturbance which is regular fire from that system you're going to push the amount of carbon in that forest up but then when wildfire does occur you're going to cause a significant drop in the amount of carbon stored in live trees whereas under the fire maintained condition you're probably oscillating around that carbon carrying capacity to some degree so you have these frequent you know relatively low impact disturbances and so you've added stability to the system so getting back to the the front part of this panel here where we've got the fire suppressed condition um, the thing to think about there is the only way we get recovery back to the pre-fire state is if we've got consistent climate conditions and climate is anything but consistent uh, hasn't you know we've, we've been in a relatively mild phase but if we look back over the geologic record it's bounced around all over the place and with our inputs of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere uh, we're increasing the rate of change and so if you have a stand replacing wildfire event uh, in one of these drier forest types followed by prolonged drought you have a real potential for type conversion to a grassland or shrubland which is a much lower carbon state than the forest and then there's some evidence in the Sierra Nevada to suggest that once you have one of these shrubby patches established, uh, it's, well, one, it's difficult for trees to establish in there because they're competing with shrubs for sunlight and water and things like that. Uh, even once they do establish and then break through the shrub canopy, they need a considerable amount of time, several decades, to get big enough that they can withstand those shrubs burning again whereas those shrubs are capable of burning within several years. And so it, the potential exists under drier, warmer conditions that we shift uh, not only to maybe a shrub dominated state following stand replacing fire, but also a more frequent fire regime in that system that excludes uh, trees from establishing. There's also been some work done in the Sierra uh, looking at the likelihood of a high, another a second fire at the same location being high severity and the severity of the fire the second fire is highly dependent on the severity of the first so in thinking about these concepts uh, we really kind of over the last I don't know eight or so years have been interested in answering a few questions as they relate to uh, management and carbon dynamics in forest and so one question we were really interested in figuring out early on was what is the relative difference in carbon stock between a fire suppressed forest and a fire maintained forest? Um, when we've got that fire suppressed condition, what are the carbon costs of reducing uh, wildfire risk? So thinning and burning. And then that's in the absence of wildfire, so we can know the immediate carbon balance of those treatments. And then in the presence of wildfire, how does that carbon balance change? And then most recently, one of the things we're working on is uh, trying to better understand the effects of projected changes in climate and disturbance on carbon dynamics uh, in the Sierra Nevada. So this figure is uh, of the, from the tea kettle experimental forest in the southern Sierra Nevada. 
And what we've got are the taller bars are uh, fire suppressed forest condition, the distribution of uh, number of individuals by diameter class, and then the smaller bars are the reconstructed 1865 forest structure, and that is the last year we had a widespread surface fire in that forest. And then the orange um, dots and, and error bars here connected by lines are the 1865 carbon stock that we calculated based on that reconstructed forest. And the brown line is the current carbon stock in that fire suppressed forest condition. And what's pretty striking to me is all summed up right out here in this 120 centimeter diameter and larger class. And so we've got a substantial amount uh, or difference in carbon in that diameter class. And that's because in the reconstructed uh, forest structure, there were many more large, very large diameter trees than we currently see uh, on the landscape. So when we were trying to understand how treatments might impact uh, the carbon balance of the system, again, we're, we're at the tea kettle experimental forest here, uh, we looked at uh, six different treatments, a control, a uh, prescribed burn, an understory thin, uh, which was designed for uh, spotted owl habitat requirements and removed uh, all trees between 25 and 75 centimeters diameter. Uh, an under, the same understory thin followed by prescribed burning, an overstory harvest which removed uh, pretty much everything except 22 of the largest individuals per hectare, and then uh, that overstory harvest followed by prescribed burning. And we quantified uh, the, the carbon in the system. Uh, one thing to note is that in these pre-treatment 1999 values, we did not actually have soil carbon measurements. That's why the bar is lower, so this brown uh, pot is we've got soil carbon immediate post-treatment and then I'll, as I'll show you in a minute 10 years post-treatment. But basically what these uh, calculations told us is that as the intensity of the treatment increased the amount of carbon in the system decreased. As my advisor said in graduate school ecology is often the painful elaboration of the obvious. So anyway uh, Fast forward 10 years, uh, and what we've got are some, some fairly striking results. Uh, and if we look at the uh, treatments, the, the burn only here and the thin and burn, and I've added this 2011 bar, so 10 years post-treatment, and I've also added this blue bar, which is the carbon balance. And so that carbon balance is the uh, increase in carbon in the forest over that 10-year period minus the carbon emitted from treatment, so prescribed burning, uh, carbon uh, associated with fossil fuel emissions from harvesting and hauling logs to the mill, carbon associated with mill inefficiency, so the waste generated, we treated that as a direct emission, and it also accounts for um, the carbon stored in dimensional lumber uh, from that initial harvest for the thinning treatments. And so what we found over that 10-year period is that the burn only and the understory thin both sequestered about 30 more metric tons per hectare than was emitted or removed uh, from treatment. And so in less than, in fewer than 10 years, we've, we've gotten back to where we were before treatment, and we've had the effect of altering the risk profile in terms of stand replacing wildfire. The understory thin and burn is still running at a, a slight carbon deficit, and this has to do with uh, the fact that we had, if you look at this white bar right here, we had uh, a few large individuals per hectare die sometime during that post-treatment period, and that transitioned that carbon from live trees sequestering carbon to dead trees uh, that eventually are a carbon source. Um, and so this suggested to us that one of the things we need to consider uh, when, when implementing these treatments from a carbon perspective is it would be beneficial to retain a few additional kind of medium-sized trees uh, as a kind of a way to hedge our bets against any post-treatment mortality. And then the other thing I'd like to point out on this figure uh, is that if we look at the control bars, so this is over a 10-year period, there's no statistical, there's hardly any difference actually between the total height of these two bars, and we see a, just a slight decline in live tree carbon here. Basically, these data suggest to me that this system in its current structure is probably at the carbon carrying capacity because over a decade, and this is you know pre most severe period of the drought, we're not seeing much change in terms of live tree carbon. So 
uh, basically what we've got going on is we've stored as much as we can and it's unlikely we're going to be able to do anything to alter that. Uh, the potential does exist and we really need to get back in there post drought uh, to, to capture this quantitatively, but the potential does exist that we could see substantial amount of mortality uh, in the system. So we got a good handle on uh, immediate treatment effects of uh, on carbon stocks. We also got a, a good handle on kind of 10-year post-treatment and if we don't perturb the system too much in, in terms of removing carbon, uh, we can recover what was removed and emitted very quickly. Uh, so then the question that I was really interested in understanding was what does the carbon balance of these treatments look like when we treat uh, the landscape with a random chance of ignition uh, at any given location. And so I'm going to take you out of the Sierra and into northern Arizona for some work we did for the DOD at Camp Navajo. And we ran a simulation experiment. This is 11,000 hectare landscape. And it's primarily pure ponderosa pine. There are a few other species sprinkled in there. Uh, but we were trying to understand what are the what are the carbon balance of, of these treatments in the presence of this random chance of wildfire. So we simulated uh, no management action across the landscape. We simulated a thin only, which removed about 30% of the biomass focused on you know, the youngest, smallest trees. And then we simulated a thin and burn, uh, which was the same thin treatment followed by prescribed burning every 10 years which is representative of kind of the mean historic fire return interval for this system. And then we did two uh, wildfire probabilities, a 1 in 50 chance of fire occurring at any given location on the landscape in any given year, and a 1 in 100 chance. And so those values actually come from the empirical range of wildfire probability for this area of northern Arizona, and they're from the low end of the range. So. I purposefully picked values that I thought would push the system uh, or, or make it harder to differentiate between the control and the thin and burn in terms of carbon. So uh, just to orient you on this figure, on the y-axis is total ecosystem carbon, on the x-axis is simulation year. The solid lines are the 1 in 50 chance of wildfire occurring, the dashed lines are the 1 in 100 chance. Uh, the shaded areas about the lines are just the range of variability or 95% confidence intervals from the number of replicate simulations we ran. And there's one uh, main take home message here from this slide and that's that we drop carbon initially when we implement the treatments and then when wildfire has a 1 in 50 chance of burning on the landscape, uh, we surpass the control the thinned and burn treatment surpasses the control in terms of total ecosystem carbon in about 40 years. Uh, and then when that chance of wildfire happening doubles, right, or halves, I guess, one in 100 chance, uh, we, we increase that time where the thinned and burn surpasses the control in terms of carbon to about 50 years, 50, 51 years. And this is a relatively slow growing system because it's a dry system. And so this was uh, pretty striking to me in that, um, you know, we've got one of the arguments you hear is that there is a relatively low probability of wildfire occurring anywhere on the landscape, and so we have to treat many more acres uh, than will necessarily be burned by wildfire. Well, in this particular system where the probability of wildfire is a little bit higher because of topography and summer lightning storms, uh, we found that there is a, a true uh, carbon benefit to thinning and burning the forest when we account for that probability of wildfire. And you can see that evidenced in the mean fire severity across the landscape. So uh, basically warm colors are higher mean severity, cool colors are lower mean severity. And if you look at the control panel here, you see a, uh, the influence of topography at this site. So this is a little bit south of here is the edge of the Mogollon Rim, and so a big canyon. Uh, and we've got some fairly steep topography on the south side. Uh, on the west side of the installation here, we've got some cinder cones, uh, so some fairly steep topography. And when we implement a thin only treatment, we do moderate some of the highest severity fire uh, down in the southwestern part of the installation, uh, but we don't have the effect of moderating that fire severity across the entire installation the way we do in the thin and burn. And that's driven by the fact that we enter once and then we don't have uh, regular fires serving to maintain reduced surface fuel levels and also forest structure. 
Uh, the difference you see in terms of fire severity across the rest of the installation in the thin and burn and then over here on the west side, uh, we excluded that from treatment because it is potential Mexican spotted owl habitat and there's also some steeper slopes. So we just took that off the table for all of the simulations because that was one of our objectives was understanding how uh, these treatments would impact the provision of habitat for a focal species. In addition to reducing mean fire severity, uh, this is the, the variability between severity of fire events across the landscape. And what we see is under the control and the thin only, there's a, a relatively high range of variability. So any given fire at any given location could be lower, it could be high severity. They tend toward high if we look at the mean fire severity for the control. But then under the thin and burn, we've pushed that variability down. So we've basically reduced that risk uh, over many replicate simulations across the landscape because uh, we are seeing mean severity values that are lower and the variability between any given fire uh, severity is lower. So to sum up this part briefly, uh, fire suppressed forest versus the historic fire maintained forest, we uh, saw larger carbon stocks in that fire maintained forest uh, in the 1865 condition. Uh, the carbon costs of treatment in the absence of wildfire are immediate and increase as a function of treatment intensity. Uh, in the less intense treatments like prescribed burn and understory thin, we can re-sequester the carbon emitted and removed from treatment in a very short period of time, less than 10 years. And over that same decade, there was no change in the control, uh, suggesting we may be at carbon carrying capacity. Uh, across the landscape with a random chance of wildfire, we found that treated forests reduce the severity of any given fire and end up storing more C, more carbon across the landscape than an untreated condition. So now bouncing back to the Sierra Nevada, uh, we've been trying to understand how projected changes in climate and climate driven changes in large wildfire will alter carbon dynamics in, uh, for the whole mountain range. And we've been using the uh, three climate models that Dan Kay and Shop down at Scripps said do the best job for interannual climate variability in the Sierra Nevada. And we've been using Leroy Westerling's associated fire projections. And what we found, and, and then we also ran a baseline case, which is the climate from uh, 1980 to 2010 to compare against. And so what we've got here are, um, this is carbon flux, so the, we're above zero, so this is carbon being taken in by the ecosystem and the units are grams carbon per meter squared, but it doesn't matter. Uh, the main take home is, is that at low elevation, we see a general decline in how much carbon the ecosystems are pulling out of the atmosphere uh, under all conditions, even the baseline, and this has to do with fire, right? And then at mid and high elevations, we see an increase uh, initially because we're recovering from disturbance there. But then as you know, large wildfire probability uh, increases, we see a decrease in the sink strength, the amount of carbon those forests are pulling out of the atmosphere relative to the baseline. And so the, uh, and here's, oh no, it gets worse after this. Um, <laughs> So this panel right here is just one of the climate models, uh, GFDL, and, and also the map on the right. And basically what we're showing here is that the percent of each of those elevation bands that is uh, a, a source of carbon in the atmosphere and is not forested by the end of century increases on average by about 5%. And then this panel on the right is uh, some explanation to why that's happening. And so this is the percent change in tree recruitment compared to the baseline condition. And you'll notice most of that map is orange, and that is a greater than 50% reduction in tree recruitment uh, across the landscape. Uh, some bright spots at higher elevation where it's gonna be a little bit warmer, better, longer growing season and more moisture, but all in all we see reduced recruitment. And then the other thing that's important to point out about this uh, figure is that when we look at the species level recruitment, we see a real shift in the species that are able to establish. They tend to be uh, dominated by more drought tolerant species like pines. And we see uh, less drought tolerant species like white fir, which make up most of the basal area in the mixed conifer forest now plunging, uh, very low recruitment. So uh, when we're looking forward for the Sierra Nevada, um, the effects of climate and disturbance, it looks like 
warmer temperature and decreasing precipitation, uh, we'll see an increase in large wildfire frequency. Uh, we'll see a decrease in the strength of the forest carbon sink. We'll see an increase in forested area that is a carbon source. And then from that prior work, an increase in the fire emissions we can expect as more area burns. So I would be uh, remiss to not talk about the uncertainty that's in this. Uh, so very potent drought the last four years, a tree killing drought. Um, one thing ecosystem models don't do particularly well is kill trees as a function of extreme climatic events. So our picture might be a little rosy. Um, so this is some work by Park Williams and colleagues uh, where they used a an extensive database of tree ring data in the southwestern U.S. and they looked at the relationship between hotter droughts and tree mortality. And Basically, there's this uh, brown band here, and that was a really big tree-killing drought event in the historic record. And then where you cross that, drought, that brown band in this index is where you tend to have tree-killing events. And so what they did was use uh, projected climate and, and look, and this is, say, Arizona, New Mexico, southern Colorado, southern Utah, by about 2050, you have a number of, you, this index suggests that we can expect many more tree killing droughts. And this has to do with that warm air sucking a lot more water and acting as a giant sponge and pulling it out of ecosystems. And these big tree killing events are not just happening in the Sierra, they're not just happening in the Southwest, uh, they're global in nature. And so this map in the center of the slide is from a colleague of mine, Craig Allen, uh, at the USGS, and he has, uh, he and colleagues have published this global map of um, where we're seeing large tree mortality events, and extensive tree mortality events, and the likely culprit for these are hotter droughts, and so that's an area that uh, many of us in in forest ecology are trying to get a better handle on is you know, what is the mechanism that's killing these trees and, uh, you know, what, what's responsible for these large events. But it looks like this idea of atmospheric water demand spiking up is uh, probably the causal mechanism uh, that at least weakens the trees and makes them susceptible to bark beetles, if not directly killing them. So we've got risks to forest carbon. Uh, high severity wildfire, increasing fire frequency, insect outbreaks, drought, increasing temperature, but more importantly, we've got the interactions between these factors that really pose uh, some significant challenges. So any increase in drought makes the forest more susceptible to insect outbreak. Increases in drought and temperature make the forest more susceptible to wildfire. And so trying to figure out how to, how to mitigate these risks is really a, a important in my mind for maintaining uh, a fully functioning eco, forested ecosystem. So there are some fortunate, here's the bright, the bright spot in my presentation. Uh, just, I want to call your attention to it. Uh, so uh, we're, you know, at the local level, right, where we actually make decisions on the ground, uh, there's lots of evidence, uh, including some work that we've done, that thinning small trees and restoring uh, surface fire is a natural process in these dry forest types that were historically maintained by fire not only lowers fire, high severity wildfire risk, but it also kind of jump starts ecosystem function again and we see a lot of other ecological benefits. Uh, there's evidence in the literature uh, to suggest that species specific thinning, so targeting overly dense species, is actually useful for uh, moderating beetle outbreak because you're basically increasing the density and also the distance between host trees for the beetles. Um, We've done some work in northern Arizona in the Ponderosa Pine looking at uh, post-thinning um, tree response to drought. And what we found is that in the post-thinned environment, the large trees were more responsive, one, so they packed on more, even more carbon. Their, their growth rate increased after treatment more than the smaller trees. And also, uh, when we did suffer several years of drought, their response to drought in terms of decreased growth was smaller than the small trees. So it really jump-started these, um, what, you know, uh, kind of the forestry community of, say, the 50s and 60s really thought of decadent old trees. Um, you know, as Nate Stevenson's work suggests and our work here suggests, these things uh, 
you know, when we release them out of that competitive environment, they can really start growing again. So I want to leave you with this. We're really facing a decision in terms of managing forest because we've got these long live trees. So any decision we make today is going to have, you know, implications for decades. And the same goes for inaction. So in these dry forest types, we're really making a trade-off in the near term. Do we restore forest structure and restore surface fire as a natural process and add potentially and hopefully add some resilience to climate change back into the system and, and pay the upfront cost of a slight reduction in the total ecosystem carbon stock um, and then uh, you know potentially down the road when we do experience wildfire we stand in a much better position for maintaining a forested condition. And I say potentially because we don't have a crystal ball for climate. And we don't know, you know when the next really severe hot drought is. Um, and then the alternative is we make the decision to do nothing and kind of roll the dice and see, you know, is this, uh, are these management actions truly necessary? Are fire sizes truly going to increase? Um, are we willing to take that gamble uh, on basically a relatively small carbon cost up front in order for a potentially large carbon loss down the road. And so uh, as a, a forest ecologist, I'm most interested in understanding uh, how these things influence the ecology of the system, right? And there's a lot of evidence to suggest that if we restore surface fire as a natural process, we see increases in plant diversity, we see increases in nutrient cycling, uh, all kinds of different ecosystem function. Uh, is kick-started again, and so I think there are a lot of ecological benefits we gain from paying that upfront relatively small carbon cost. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions.